Hey, and welcome to Handmade Hero Show. We code a complete game live on stream. We are currently today uh, doing some cleanup on the collision code. Uh, I, we we accidentally um, yet last week we were just trying to add some ability to step through like diagrams so we could analyze the collision system uh, when it went wrong. We accidentally fixed the bug. Uh, it it turned out we it was once we had the ability to like scrub through things and see what was happening. It became very uh, straightforward for us to find the bug uh, accidentally, uh, so we we actually fixed it, uh, and that's great. But um, I I wasn't totally satisfied with that because it was very strange what the bug was. Uh, it turns out there's like entities in our uh, system that are basically having their they're, they're getting created and they have sort of. Uh, rectangles that don't actually have any area for uh, collision. And so that may be fine because we we do want to have that occur. But the problem is we need to think about whether or not we need to make sure that was intentional. And I think it probably was. But we need to make sure that that's actually smart. Maybe we want a bit field for that um, because it's kind of expensive to say, like, is this collision, uh, we have to actually compare, like, floating point values and all this crap to know that there's no collision. So we may not want to do that. So we may want to add a bit field. We had one in there a long time ago that was like, does this thing collide or not? And we decided it was ne necessary, uh, but maybe it is, actually is. So we have, is, is that what should be happening? Two, are these actually things that don't have collision, or is there a bug in the world generator that's generating things that should have had collision volumes and don't? Two. Uh, and three, what we would like to do is, even if we find out there's no bugs in here, what we would like to do uh, is finish up things that need to get finished up on the collision system, such as re-enabling the ability to move out of uh, starting collisions. So if you start embedded in an object because the gameplay code just like moved someone there or whatever, we want you to be able to get out of that. So we, we want that. Uh, and then the other thing that we want is the spatial partitioning um, to avoid having to test all the entities in the world when we do collision. So when we when we check for collision, we don't right now, right? Uh, we're going to uh, have to sweep through all like everything, right? Well, we we have to sweep through every entity in the entire uh, active set, which is quite a few. I mean, I don't know how many it is, but it could be on the order of like ten thousand entities or something, because the active set is quite large. Um, so, you know, it, it could be very large. It probably isn't that large right now. It's probably like 1,000 or something or 2,000. But we're sweeping through all of those entities for every check of every collision, it, it, which is just ridiculous. Uh, it's The game should be running at an absolute crawl, but it's not just because um, processors are so fast. So what we want to do is stop that. We want to, when we um, unpack people into the world, we want to actually uh, now have some idea about where they are so that we only check entities that are close by to the one that is moving. Now, this doesn't have to be perfect. It, it can be a fairly loose boundary, right? Um, but there are some difficulties involved and it and there are some decisions we have to make about how we want the system to work because we when we produce the spatial partition, we will have the situation where as we then move entities, they will move where they are in the spatial partition. So it's not static. Like if you remember, look, we did exactly this before with the lighting we take the the current like things that are within the view at that time and we build a spatial partition before we start doing lighting for looking up ray tracing um and that was fine but it, it, it assumed that you did not have to move things around so we knew that we could just like pile all the stuff in there and the system could just be optimized for the lookup it doesn't have to be optimized for moving things. This one will be different. In this one, we have to have entities be able to move. Now, there's a lot of stuff we can consider doing here. Um, and 
my assumption is that because this is running so fast already, that we don't have to be very fancy. Because right now, we have no spatial partition, and the code's still running, right? Um, so, for example, uh, you know, if we, if we open it up here... Uh, <clears throat> so let me go ahead and just run the program. Uh, and what you can see is uh, even in this circumstance where we're literally doing ridiculous numbers of collision checks for like the glove here, um, it still runs in, in a pretty reasonable frame rate. Uh, it's not great, I don't think. Like I don't know what the frame rate is right now, but it's probably not fantastic, right? Um, what's the quick way for that? Yes, it's uh, it's thirty frames a second, right? Um, but honestly, like that's not really significantly lower. You can see though, as the collision moves around, you see how it spikes, right? It's spiking down to like fifteen frames a second, right? Um, so you can kind of see like it has a, a really negative a uh, impact, right? So it it's running fine, but it's bad, and you it will get worse when there's like several colliders, like you know, there's gonna be ten, twenty things on the screen at least that will be undergoing collision right now there's like only one or maybe there's another one it depends i don't know if there, any of those skull guys are in the working set right now i don't think they are um but you can see why that's a problem because that's horrible for just one thing and the reason for that like i said is that it's sweeping through everything so but the fact that that's still running at interactive frame rates means we probably don't have that much work to do meaning we don't have to go crazy with this. We can probably just do something fairly straightforward and not be in too much trouble, right? Um, so I'm guessing that just a simple grid, uh, like a simple voxel where we just can move things around the voxel as necessary is going to be all that we really need. Um, and so uh, I probably will just do something like that. But if we were seeing uh, much, like if this were running at one frame a second generally, uh, I would I would be more worried and maybe would be trying to do something more aggressive, right? Um, so yeah, and you can see there, right? Like, so here's an example, I think, of these getting stuck. Um, can I look at this? Here's an example you can see of uh, these objects getting getting stuck, right? Um, which is what we would expect to have happen now, because right now we allow things to be placed I in ways that <clears throat> uh, will make them interpenetrate. So that's not actually strange. Uh, but one thing I do wonder a little bit is why it allowed these these are two colliding objects. So I'm not quite sure why they were allowed to do this in the first place. Um, but like I said, we don't really right now try to guarantee that, meaning we don't really try to guarantee that things don't end slightly interpenetrating after they've both moved. Um, like our refinement step is not particularly careful about that. So I could also believe that this was fine. The point is, uh, yeah, you can see right here, right, um, it's gotten into a, a situation where it's, like, entirely colliding on step one. You know what I'm saying? Here was the step before that. Let's just take a quick look at it. So you can see that it allowed it to be placed there. It allowed this guy to be placed there. The, you know what the other thing is we kind of need? We need some way to pick who we're looking at because this guy moved second, so he's the one who was allowed to move into that placement, right? Um, so, yeah. But uh, I assume basically just what's going on here is that we don't really require any kind of symmetric checking, <clears throat> So because these objects move um, themselves, I'm not sure there's really anything smarter we can do. Let me, th let me try to think about this for a second. So when two objects move, right now what we do, we move them in order. 
And we don't really do anything in particular to try to ensure that they're not going to interpenetrate. We could. So one thing we could do is always check only the lower entity. So <clears throat> I know what I'm saying. It sounds pretty weird, but collision checks are symmetric in the sense that when we ask when two objects collide or not, that's not a different question semantically. Meaning, if I have two objects A and B, and I ask whether they collide, I don't semantically want that to be directional. I don't want the answer to does A collide with B to be different from does B collide with A, right? Like, that's not what I actually want. <clears throat> Um, so what's interesting about that is it means that maybe I should think about the way the collider works because right now that's not what happens. Right now what happens is when we do collision moves, we are thinking about one object and we ask if that object could be placed at certain points in the world um, and have the collision query say that it will not collide with a different object, right? Um, and I'm not sure... No, I can guarantee that that's not correct uh, commutatively, right? Because when you check the two collisions, you're checking the, the corner points for one of the objects against only this, the actual position of the other object, right? And so I think what you probably want to do instead is you want to check to see whether or not the other objects, like you want to pick one of the objects and say, uh, if we were, you, I mean, I guess you could do it either way. You could say, we want to check to see whether we collide at the points or whether the other object collides at the points, right? Um, or you could always just pick the lower object. So you could say like, look, whoever has a lower entity ID, it's just a tiebreaker, arbitrary tiebreaker. Whoever has the lower entity ID, we check their coll collision voxel and we make sure that they are not colliding in that case, right? Um, This is an interesting question. I feel like there's probably a smart answer here, but I've never really thought about it before. There's a lot of ways that come to mind. So the simplest way that I can think of actually is you don't bother doing that. Um, the simplest way I can think of is actually just that you you take the point where the entity is and you snap it to the center of the voxel before checking. That might be preferable because then you're always asking the same question. And I'm not sure that you need to be any fancier than that to make this work. So, so I might, I might, um, well, you know what, first, let me make sure that this happens often. It should, 
When you have two colliding objects, this should happen like all the time right now. Um, let me see, uh, just to make sure uh, that this is something that can happen often. And assuming that it is, uh, I would like to propose a fix for that, which we can do right now. Again, I'm, the reason I'm doing this before, because the unembed code would have just fixed that problem, but I'd rather just never have that problem to begin with in the collision system first. And if I fix the unembed code, um, then I, I won't be able to fix it because I won't see it happen. So there, I think that is was it, right? Um, that was the system detecting that fact. It's not as easy as I would like. Like, it does take a little while to make this happen. Like, I'm able to kind of, like, muck around an uncomfortably large amount of time, um, unfortunately. I don't know if that means I'll have to create a situation where two things move towards each other where I think it will happen more frequently and just create that circumstance. Um, because, like, man, this takes a long time. There we go. So, like, I can make it happen, uh, but it, eh, it's not as reliable as I would like. It's not as reliable as I would like. Um, so what I'm suggesting here, right, <clears throat> is that for purposes of the collision, like, everything is discrete. That's what I'm basically saying. So, uh, if, for example, I went and let's go to move entity... And in the uh, when it calls collides at P here, if I was to say, okay, we know when you look at this code, we're passing in an entity point here, right? And we then test against entity points, and the entity points are, like, going to be snapped. So this right here would be snapped to like the center of a uh, of a voxel. And it, as I'm thinking about this, I'm wondering in my head as well. Should we have done this system slightly differently? Have I have I overcomplicated things? If instead of choosing corners, if we had just tested the centers of voxels to begin with, and then used just can I stand at the center of this voxel as the thing? Would I not be able to test like far fewer voxels and get basically the exact same behavior? Um, and then you always consider yourself to be at the center of the voxel that you start. Yeah. Is that just better? I think it is. I think that's just smarter. So I feel like what we probably want to do is just simplify this code down a little bit so that you don't have to do that checking that I was doing. And the grid is just now center points of the voxels. You are in the voxel that you would round to towards the center of the voxel. Yeah, I don't know why I didn't think of that first. It seems like we can just collapse this scheme down to that. And then everyone is just considered to be in the center of the voxel they're actually in. Right? I don't really know why I didn't do that. Like most things, I think sometimes these things are so complicated. Like most things in games if you actually want to go look at a problem really carefully, are complicated enough that your brain doesn't really understand it all 
until you've actually gone and done it. And then you see like, oh, actually, this is much simpler when you <clears throat> sort of when you actually iron out all the details, it turns out that like the complexity can be collapsed down, but it not in a way that your brain could have understood at the time, right? So that does actually seem pretty straightforward. And I might just say that's what we should do. It's way easier and way less computation. I guess I was just being kind of blunt, uh, uh, obtuse. I want to scroll down. I want to scroll down. I can't see in my head. There we go. Um, so yeah, I mean, gosh, that just seems way better. Like. Like, that's just so much better because then, like, you just say, look, we just have a voxel dimension. Um, there's no corner code. It's just center code, right? Um, and the best part is now the center code is actually just a Boolean because you know whether or not you pushed it uh, or tested it. You don't have to share corners. It's just like if you're going to push something, you test it. If you're not going to push something, you don't test it. Um, that's really it. So this gets way better. In fact, you could just do this and say center code and it says like pushed or not, right? <clears throat> pushed open not. Yeah, I think that literally just collapses down to, did we push this or not? So we would just have have tested and like either we've tested it or not. And if we haven't tested it, we test it. If we have it and optionally move there if uh, or consider it, right? All right. Well, that was embarrassing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's not embarrassing. Like, uh, like I always say, like, this is why it's I'm the type of person who always like. I think you, you, you have like there's there's two types of people out there, right? Um, you've got like the people who give like a lot of conference presentations who anytime they figure out something even remotely mundane, they they think it's amazing and want to say how great they are. Um, and then there's other people like myself who, whenever they figure something out, they think they were stupid for not figuring it out earlier. They're both the same thing. Uh, it's just uh, probably one makes you feel a lot smarter than you are and one makes you feel stupider than you are. But I don't know that there's actually a bad thing about that. I think feeling stupid is probably good um, because it makes you try to be smarter. Whereas feeling smart is probably bad because it means that you're not trying very hard to, to not be stupid and you probably still are stupid. Anyway, difference of opinion. Point being, this was dumb. Because now what we really need <clears throat> is voxel corners can just be voxel center. Uh, you get back what the cell was that you were in, whether or not uh, it's like possible to move there. The repulsion vector can still be the same, uh, and the embedded flag can still be the same. Um, so all this stuff just kind of still works fine, I think. Uh, and we probably can now just simplify all that code down to something much more straightforward that doesn't have to look at corners or any of that stuff. So it'll be much faster. Uh, and we can always do our testing only at voxel centers. So when we do the refinement step, we will allow testing outside of centers but for all actual movement stuff, um, we will always test at centers, meaning that it will now be symmetric, uh, which is what we want. So I think 
this is like way better. Uh, but I guess it remains to be seen. So we'll type in the code first before declaring it as such. Okay. So when we come into move entity, uh, what you can see here is we do like um, an align to movement voxel, and that all is fine. Uh, I think that's that code would be the same no matter what happens because the voxel is the voxel whether we're talking about the center or not uh, doesn't matter, right? Now, there is one thing that is possibly true, which is that if we just simply don't need that anymore, we can stop talking about the cell entirely and just talk about the grid point. So it may be such that we don't really need this idea, because if you think about it, if we're just stepping along centers, what the heck did we need the cell for? So really, like, align to movement voxel... Align to movement voxel can just be the center points now. Right? I mean, I just don't know that any of this stuff is necessary. So I think this just doesn't matter. I think we still need the bounds on movement. I mean, it's really just because of store. The, the only reason we even need the bounds on movement is because of storage size. Um, we wouldn't even need that. So, like, that's another thing to think about, whether we actually want. Once you don't have to really do this, there's other options you could think of. I... I... I'm not going to do that right now. So I'm still going to say that, look, we've got a delta P here, and that's going to give us effectively, like, an ending P. So we're still going to do this, right? Um, but we're now talking about these centers, right? Uh, which are, like, we're talking about being at the center of the voxel. So instead of a floor, uh, right, this is going to be more of, like, a rounding operation here in a line. So, like... When we align to the movement voxel here, what we're really talking about is like that. Um, because we want to go to whatever's closest. We're, we're like snapping to a center, not down to a, a floor. Other than that, I think the rest of this code just works. And then the like voxel min corner, max corner, like none of this stuff really even matters anymore. We probably don't need the voxel grid... We probably don't need any of that stuff. Um, I, I think we just don't need that anymore. So like in here where we talk about uh, the grid stuff, um, I, I really just don't think any of that matters now. We've got the voxel... Uh, Yeah, like, we've got the starting P and the ending P. I can see why these are getting, like, min corners. We, but, again, I don't know that we need any of this. I, I think we're just going to, like, get rid of this. 
Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I don't think we need any of this. And that way, too, like this part here, like if we want to do the expansion side of things, um, this would just be like these two values. starting and ending. Um, this is still correct. The only difference is I don't think it's two times anymore because we now know that the movement grid is exactly what we're looking at. We want to expand it by one on either side, but it was rounded, so we don't need to expand one side more than the other, which is what we do in a floor. When you floor something, you have to expand the high side twice and the low side once, but when you round, you're just expanding each side once because you've already said, well, we're only going in the, the region that we actually cared about. So I think this becomes a simpler uh, set of things to do here, right? Um, I think that's it. This stuff all works just fine. Uh, the span part of things, I don't know that this matters at all. Like, I don't know that we care about the span anymore. We know what it is. This is just for an assertion. Um, so I don't think we care about the voxel dimension anymore. Like, I'm pretty sure we just don't care. We can assert... Um, We can assert that, like, the span is less than the stack dimension uh, because we do care about that, right? Um, <clears throat> I guess I'm not sure, certain if we need to round that first, though. Like, like maybe we do. I don't know. Um, anyway. What is this about? It's like putting a weird, like, error. Oh, because I'm holding my mouse there. Um, so I think that's all fine. We'll see as we go. Uh, initial cell and target cell I are just going to be the indexes um so they're just like this code right um but we so so really Really, all we need to do is round these with the align to movement voxel thing. <clears throat> so when we do align to movement voxel, this is the thing that actually like produces the value that we cared about here. Um, So when we want to get the movement voxel index for a particular thing, we need to know what the min corner is. But other than that, that's it. So we would just say, like, get movement voxel index, and then we subtract them. So, like, this code right here is that actual value. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So this code is, is basically the same. And it's just like, after you do the round, you're just doing a round... Uh, that goes to a integer value instead of not, right? So this code is, is like that. So once we know what the uh, rounded version is, <clears throat> the only question is, do we want to do deltas or not? And I'm not entirely sure. Um, that part's a little bit tricky. I'm not sure. 
but uh, we can, if we want to know these, these are like supposed to be relative to the base grid. So I think what we do is we just say like uh, voxel min corner. Um, and we pass in here the, in the start, you know, the voxel start P. So these two pieces are now like, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, are now just based on on that one piece of information. Oh, whoops. I didn't mean... That was dumb. I didn't mean to actually delete the voxel stack there. What I meant to do was leave the voxel stack, but get rid of the voxel grid. My bad. <clears throat> so, basically what we want to do here is get rid of that. Um, so we do still want the voxel stack. We just don't need to initialize it with anything. It's just empty, right? So we can initialize the voxel stack with nothing. Um, and, and off it goes. We have it all. We don't really need to do the diagram box thing, but I'm going to anyway, uh, by saying like rect min max and passing the voxel start p voxel end p, but I actually want to use the ones where we um, like got them into the correct positions and then expanded them <clears throat> just to be able to show the whole thing. Uh, so then when we do the uh, voxel corners bit, we don't really need the check corners thing anymore. So, so like that whole thing, this is why I say, I feel like this is just way smarter. And I don't know why I was, I was thinking corner. I was thinking about voxel corners instead of voxel centers. Um, <clears throat> there are times when you care about one and times when you care about the other. <clears throat> also tim775 uh, that's like that's the part of the personality type though right so for me i don't want to keep going when i feel smart i want to keep going when i feel stupid right when i don't understand something is when i'm most motivated to look into it so that's like the part about personality types, right? Um, it's also why I have a hard time with a lot of games is because like once I kind of roughly understand something, I, I don't really want to play them anymore. Um, so I always, I always work harder when I feel like I don't understand something. And then once I feel like I understand it too much, I get a lot less interested in doing it. Um, because I'm just like, well, what am I going to learn, right? Like, not much. So. Anyway. Uh, so let's see here. So the voxel corners thing, again, is not very necessary anymore. Like, this whole thing uh, doesn't have to happen. And so really all we're going to do is we're going to get the current cell I and we can just look it up directly in here, I think. Right. So we can basically say, like, look, we're going to look up the corner code uh, for this voxel. Actually, we don't even need to do that uh, because we already know that we can stand here. So the only thing we're going to do is, like, check the directions we want to travel in from here right so we already know we already know we can stand here because we've checked it right and the embedded part is the only problem that we're going to have so when we get up here yeah so we do want we want something like this which is like that checks for collision but we wouldn't be doing it here is my point right so 
So we wouldn't be doing it here. Um, and uh, embedding will have to kind of, we'll have to work out in a different way. So, looking at this part of the cell code, get closest point in box conservative. If we want to know what the cell is, it's literally just wherever we are. So the cell center P and then the cell dimension is just the cell, right? And so knowing the position is very simple. The cell center P is just the current cell I times the cell dim plus whatever the voxel min corner was. Right? Um, All right, so uh, yeah, so the the this two p part of things, right? The this two p is just, I believe, it's just the two p. But we um, have like an adjustment that we're gonna do for embed code, so we're gonna leave that part in. Um, this part does an if not found best, so that's just to skip over the part uh, where it decides it doesn't need to look for stuff anymore, uh, so it doesn't do this part of things. So when we do this, uh, again, this part now is much more straightforward. So when we actually go to check various sides, there's only going to be one test here, right? So each one of these is just going to be like, um, like something like should test corner. You know what I mean? Um, and should test corner is going to want to do this. It's going to pass like whatever that um, thing was that it was building for the next voxel I. Um, and so what I might say is that like push voxel stack, we could just roll that into that call. I'm having trouble deciding. It would be relatively free for us here too if we wanted to to allow diagonal movement now, but I just don't know that we want to. but we definitely could allow it now. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so like when we go in here, uh, I guess I can see why we had the voxel grid part of things, but I'm not sure we actually want to keep it. Like I said, we probably want to just re remove it because it's a little bit misaligned for our needs now, but... So when we do should test corner, <clears throat> uh, what I'm trying to figure out is what's the best way to structure this part here? Like, we can, 
do it this way. But that seems kind of redundant because we're already calling a function whose only job is to do literally that. You know? So it seems like maybe what we would want to do instead is just have that be what this code does. Right? So when we call push voxel stack, this code checks to see whether we actually want to do that. Now, the only reason not to do that is that push voxel stack then would need like the condition code, which it would have to get by doing an actual test. So in order to call collides at P, it needs the sim region, the entity, and the P, which it doesn't actually have, right? So maybe what we do is something more like this uh, so that we have like in push voxel stack, we have like the condition code. Maybe that goes on the end. Right Now, the reason I don't like that is because it should check the corner code first. So that just seems to, it seems to me that you really do want this to be one thing. <clears throat> right? So effectively, you come in here and you do this. And this is predicated, right? So you're like... Right, so you basically say, all right, we're we're going to go and look to see whether we can stand on this or not, and if we can or can't, we're gonna like go ahead and push that on. There's got to be some more stuff in here, which is like when we push things on the stack, uh, we have to look to see whether or not we can be there or not uh, based on the embed code. So there's gonna be a little bit of of extra fungibility there. But so basically, what has to happen is this. <clears throat> Uh, where we say, you know, go ahead and, and put that on there. Now, again, maybe this is the wrong way about it. Maybe these should actually be out in the code here, but I don't know. It's really hard to say. Um, but you can see it would, it would now look basically like that. value for the entity is going to be derived from i so i'm pretty sure we don't need that right <clears throat> um And then if we had a way, um, and maybe we sort of do, so like if we came in here and said, let's not phrase it that way, let's phrase it this way, where we say current cell plus like side x zero zero, you know what I mean? Um, then what we could do is say, well, each one of these just rolls into that call. Right. <clears throat> so at that point, this also seems a little bit unnecessary because you essentially have this flip thing happen, right? Where side X you can see here like we already have the thing we actually wanted to test, which is, you know, you, you could just do 
Um, in fact, you don't even need the flip part of things. You could just put this at the bottom. Like, this is just dumb, right? Because all you're doing is this. Like, side x equals not side x. Um, I suppose it's, maybe it's more compact to write it that way, because you'd have to initialize the variable up here, but, you know. So anyway, <clears throat> a little bit more compact, which is nice. Um, and then the min corner value, I think probably what I would do is say, like, the min corner value... Um, and, and maybe, like, the better way to say this is min center. Like, this is the min center point of this voxel. So I think that's what we roughly want. And in here, uh, we're going to have this problem where when you're embedded, you can't push on, so you wouldn't be able to move at all, right? Um, and so that's okay right now. Um, we're just not going to deal with that at the moment. Uh, so we'll we'll take a look at that later. But at the moment, we just want to do the sim region stuff. I don't actually know what that's called here. It's just region, not sim region. Uh, so basically what we're going to do here is, yeah, just have push voxel stock, stack handle that. So we set up the min center piece so that it knows what that would actually be. Uh, we come through here and, you know, this cell center P would be maybe something that we have a call for. So we just say like, this code, for example, Yeah, so all of this stuff now goes away too, right? So we can basically get rid of this voxel iterator nonsense. We don't need it anymore. Don't know where that was actually defined. All right. I guess it was all all <coughs> in, encompassing. Um so I think I think we're all good. So if we have all these already defined, we should then be able to do a thing where we say from the voxel stack, um, we can take the voxel min center We can add the cell dim. And we can get any center out that way trivially, right? So that allows us to do the operations we actually care about, um, which is like this here. Uh, can now just be like get cell center p here's the stack here's the index um, and off we go when we do push voxel stack here uh, we need to do uh, checking against the is in bounds or is in rectangle or whatever I don't know if we have. One of these too many functions. Too much volcano. So 
So we really just don't have, you know, there's too many, <laughs> there's too much volcano. Um, there's too many of these. Like if we, you know, if this were a normal project, I would have a much cleaner math library for it. Uh, because, you know, it'd be something that I would spend time cleaning up. Uh, but on a project like Handmade Hero, where you kind of drop in and out of it, it tends to get a little bit more sprawling. It's not as, you know, tidy. But, what are you going to do? So anyway, uh, really all we need to check here is if this thing is you know, not too far out of bounds. We we want effectively this uh, function, right? Um, but we don't have it because the gen v3 uh, is like a different thing. And, and I, it's, it's actually not, like you see the type def here is the same. So I'm guessing that means that actually, actually we can just use that. So I guess we can just use this. We can say is in array bounds, um, and then we can just say like, well, it's not voxel stack dim, is it? I guess it is. I think that's all we really need. Um, Probably. So is in array bounds. Is all we really need for that. Um, now the pushed part of things, the push voxel stack part um, is just like have tested. Because we may never have pushed it. Right, so we're really just saying, have we ever tested this particular one? Um, once we go to visit it, we only want to visit it once, so we say never visit it again, which is all that does, and then we call collides at p, um, and we pass the sim region, the entity, and then the p value here is just the like get min, uh, uh was it get voxel center p? It's just the center p for whatever the in, whatever the index was that they passed in. So we're just going to test it at that point, right? I think that's all we need. Uh, the collision field that comes back from this. Uh, for embedding purposes, <clears throat> um, I guess we now need to return. Uh, and we'll look at how this data flow works in a, in a little bit because we, we probably want to make some modifications. But Right. <clears throat> so something like this. Um, this code is now gone. Right. Um, it's just not a thing anymore. Uh, so all of that is is just not necessary, which is why I said I think this is just better, right? So All right.
so the best cell thing, so this code right here, um, is probably all we really need. So I'm not sure we care about the rest of that. We could make that an actual call. I'm not sure if we want to or not. We maybe do. Uh, in which case, you know, we would just make our own version. So, like, get cell bounds. Um, and we could put that in here as well. So in here we'd pass whatever the index was, and this would return. Probably just by calling this, and we'll assume that'll be sufficient. So we'd call rec center dim with whatever the stack value was. Uh, the cell dim we, again, need here. And then everyone can call this when they want the information about the entire rectangle. And so now we just want to kind of clean this up a bit um, before debugging it uh, because it's kind of all garbaged up now and probably isn't quite as like properly aligned now than it as it should be um <clears throat> and then maybe we weld these things together because the voxel grid probably if we just added a feature that allowed it to be created um we could use the voxel grid here so we may don't want to go merge that code so that there's just like one set of voxel code like in the system or whatever. Like maybe we want to do that. I don't actually know. Uh, it's hard to say if we actually want that or not. You know, we, we, we might we might not. Um, so now like, yeah, you know, surprisingly that just ran the first time, uh, which is actually not what I was expecting to have happen. Um, and not only does it run, but it's, like, doing something. But I don't think it's actually working, right? You can see, like, it's it's doing the opposite of what you would expect it to do, I think, in a lot of cases. Maybe not. No, no, I guess it's actually... <laughs> it's running and it's working, which are not things that I would have expected it to do. So that worked unreasonably well. Uh, for something that probably shouldn't have. There you go. It got stuck there or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, it's like it shouldn't be working as well as it's working because we literally just kind of slapped that in there. Um, I guess that's good. I'm, I'm not going to complain too hard. But uh, it's definitely, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway. Uh, you know what I might do, too, while we're at it? I, I'm just kind of tired of looking at the world in wireframe, so I, I might turn that um, off for now. So the code where we kind of nerfed the... Um, we nerfed the part where we drew the actual entities for cubes. Um... At least I think that's what we did. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just going to put that back in. Probably something we should have a debug switch for, right? But, um, so, yeah, like, again, I I'm kind of surprised that that works. Uh, but, you know. 
uh, I'm sure it doesn't work very well. So like that was, you know, I guess that was a, a good first um, go at it. But like, yeah, as you can see, it gets stuck really easily. So, you know, it's, it's, it's incorrect what I typed in, which is what I would have expected. But um, it's surprising that it works as well as it does. Uh, that was un unexpected. So what I'd like to do is go through now and just clean this up uh, a little bit more. If we look at the move entity call, uh, so the first thing I was saying is like what, like maybe we can collapse these down uh, to the voxel grid stuff. Uh, the stack is is quite a bit different, but it's possible that we could change it around. I I don't. The reason I'm worried about that is because the voxel grid is not based around centers. The voxel grid is based around corners, so. You know, I don't know if I want it to... I don't know if I want to try and make those both work together. There's not that much reason why you can't do that, but it does... <sighs> My instinct says no, like not for collision code. You probably want to be working on centers if you're working on centers always. So that's why I'm a little hesitant to do that. I do, however, think we could move the voxel stuff out of there and into the other piece of code. Um, so that part, I'm not sure about. Like, like we could say that, you know, the voxel stack goes in here because it's a voxel-y kind of thing. Um, and, and we push that code out into this voxel part of things because they're all, like, voxel-y things. Um, so I might kind of do something like that. Hard to say. I'm 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 undecided, undecided. Um. So there's some pretty nice aspects of this. So when we actually call refine voxel placement, we now know like what we're actually doing. So when we do like get closest point in box conservative and we pass like the from P and the two P here, uh, that was actually not necessary, right? Um, the from P part of things we don't actually have to do. So this actually ha solves the problem we had before, which is that this code was actually garbage. Now this code doesn't have to be garbage because we can do, um, Instead, one where we say clamp just the local target, right? And then we will refine the voxel placement based on the center point. So like that. <clears throat> because now we know we are starting from the center of the voxel, which we have tested and know that we can occupy. And then we're not going to move outside of the bounds of it because we clamped this to the bounds of it. So uh, that is actually way better. So again, the center, voxel centers, way better for collision. Um, we are finding out rapidly. Uh, base everything off your voxel centers, and I think you're in better shape. Uh, so anyway, um, I think all of that is fine. So let's take a look at now the rest of this code uh, a little bit more carefully. So I don't know what dir does now. Um does it do anything? No. Uh, what does side do? So side only exists here, right? Um, so that to me uh, suggests that this probably could be written directly in here. You know what I mean? Now, the only point of this anyway is just to make sure we look in the faster direction first, which is just an optimization. So even this is kind of stupid, right? Um, but hopefully what you can see here is like... This code could just be that. Uh, 
Probably. Um, I mean, maybe not. I'm just trying to code this a little bit cleaner. So, like, if you have, there's just way too much garbage in here. So, so let's say, let's do this differently. We now know basically what we're doing. Right? And we're doing this. We start out with these. <clears throat> um, we know we want to do this loop twice. And at the end, we just do this. Negate side each time. Right, so now we know that we've <clears throat> pushed on the three ones that are going in the direction we're actually trying to go, and then we flip them, and we push the other ones the second time, right? Um, that's what we're doing here. And at that point, one has to ask oneself why you would not just do this. Which is what the compiler is going to do anyway, and that's probably easier to read, right? I think that is a cleaner way to write that. Um, that just that just seems like what you want. So I'm gonna I'm gonna call that good. So I think that's all we need for that part of the code. It's pretty straightforward, right? So we're just testing, and we test in that order. And that's all we do. Um, we don't have the embedding stuff in here yet, so we're going to do that in a second. But I want to do the first part first. So this code is now quite simple, right? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and it, I mean, maybe what we do want to do is sort of, I don't know, maybe we do want to have the embed stuff here. So like, if we were in an embedded state, um, it would be like this. So the collision field has the occupied flag. Um, and we'd have to imagine that if it came back occupied, then we are embedded to start with, right? If we're embedded to start with, then what we're doing is we're searching through embedded space for some place that's not embedded. Um, and so uh, when we when we look at a particular point, we're going to allow ourselves to we're going to allow ourselves to post so i t i take that back uh, i think actually all, we don't even need that we just need one we don't even need to track this am i wrong um you know i might be wrong um I think all that happens here is that if we are embedded, we are allowed to move to embedded. So basically, that doesn't have to happen, and neither does that. This doesn't happen. So what we do here is we just do a push voxel stack, um, and we don't return anything. Uh, all we do 
is say uh, that if we are embedded, we're allowed to move to somebody else who was embedded, right? So in the event that we haven't tested whoever it is, uh, we do the collides at p test, and we just say that the result occupied has to be equal to uh, our occupied, or or like um, um, originator occupied. So whoever originated this move, they just pass us in whether they were occupied or not, and we can only move to one that's the same as what we are, right? Because we're embedded and we need to get unembedded, and so the only thing we are allowed to do is move to the closest unembedded space, and that's the end of our move, right? Now, one could argue that we're supposed to do that and then also be able to move, but uh, I don't know about that. So I think I'm going to leave it at that for now. So if that's the case, then really all we do here is just say that when we re when we pop the voxel stack here, right? Um, and, and so I guess I, uh, I maybe misspoke. The first push voxel stack does have to be able to always work. And I suppose that's the one thing that we're not really ex sort of doing here. Meaning this one has to work no matter what. So it's almost like a mask in that sense. You know what I mean? Um, Cause we don't want you to move back to this point. So this one maybe maybe there's just like that which is like look you have to, you have to push this on. Yeah. Uh, something like that. I don't know. Well, well blah, blah, blah. So in push voxel stack here, right? This is just more complicated, unfortunately, right? What we need to be able to do is we want to be able to do this code, and we want to be able to do it either with this condition or always, right? So you can imagine, like, there's an always flag here. <laughs> And so that's a little bit jank, right? Um, so it's, yeah, it's not as good. I'm trying to think if there's a better way to do this part. Because what we really want to be able to do here is just say, look, if we were embedded, we're just trying to find the closest unembedded space. Oh, so actually maybe there's a different way to do that. Maybe what you're doing is actually something like is actually something like this. If the originator was occupied, then you could move to either, right? That actually makes more sense. So it's actually like if, if the result is not occupied or the originator was occupied, that's actually what you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like if the originator was occupied or the place that we're moving to is not occupied, 
So I think the only problem we then have there is knowing the answer to this question, which has to be stored on the stack, meaning the cell stack has to track whether or not that put point was occupied or not, right? Which means maybe we can untangle this code a little bit more because if that's the case, then maybe we can just say, well, no, because we still have to track who pushed us on. So you see what I'm saying? I'm not the only thing I'm not sure about here is where I get this flag from. It seems like it has to be stored on the stack, and I'm not sure if there's a more clever way, right? Um, now the one thing I could do is store it in here. So this could be a corner code, right? Um, so basically, it's like the zero one two thing. So instead of have tested. Uh, this could be like, you know, an occupy code. So it's like zero if you've never tested it, one if it's occupied, two if it's unoccupied, or vice versa, right? And then what you would do is you'd pull it out here um, where you would say like... Um, So you'd pull out the occupy code for the one you were on, you'd pass it in and say this is the occupy code that I'm oops. This is the occupy code that I came from. Uh, and then the code would be able to do a test there to determine which one it should use. Um... That's the actual code for it. I'm going to write that in a slightly different way. It's the same thing, but I'm just going to write it as equals zero because I want to emphasize the fact that it's now a um, like a code. It's zero, one, two. So now when we go in here, what we would say is we need to do the uh, test. And so what we're going to do is set the occupy code equal to uh, the result occupied. Um, that's going to be zero or one or, or like true or false. So what we need to do is set it to like if it's occupied, it's one thing. If it's unoccupied, it's the other. Right. So maybe it's two and one. I don't know. Uh, so then what we want to be able to do here is something like if the originator code, which is this thing, um, if the originator code is uh, 2, so I think what we want is this way. Although I, I guess it doesn't really matter. I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, so we're going to produce a code. We're going to store the code. We know that whatever we stored will get sent back in here when we're trying to do a move. We want to do something like this, right? 
So as long as whoever the originator was, if we just want to set the code equal to whatever would make this be true in the case we care about. So for example, if it's occupied, right, um, then, yeah, I, I mean, we, what we probably want to do is say, look, if this code is greater than the originator code, and uh, that way, like, um, that way what we would do is say, look, in the case where the originator code was occupied, then the thing we moved to could be occupied or unoccupied. So we just say uh, occupied is one, unoccupied is two. So then when we do the move, we just test to make sure that like, all right, if you are coming from an unoccupied, you're a two. So you can't move into a one. You can only move into a two, which would be this, right? If you are occupied, you can move into an occupied or an unoccupied. So we use, again, greater than or equal to, right? For pushing uh, on at the beginning, oops. Now we have a clear path here as well, which is to say that we can just pass a one there or a zero, right? Which just says that it doesn't matter what happens, you're gonna move, right? Um, so that's kind of handy because now like all that stuff makes reasonable sense, right? Okay. So now I think that handles um, embed codes just fine. <clears throat> it wouldn't require repulsion here, meaning this will just find, if there's a way to get out, it'll find it. Um, the problem is only in the best distance calculation. So I think actually this code doesn't need to be here anymore. Um, I think this is now just entirely correct. The search just works, everything's fine. The only problem with this code now is we want it to pick the closest point to the embedded location right? So we don't really want to allow you to move in a direction. We want you to now have to be searching for the closest point to you. Um, and so that's a little tougher because it means that push voxel stack needs like an if statement here. Um, and the problem is we almost want to do the test early. So, so like, we kind of want to do... Um, this. And in the event that we find here... Uh, we probably want to do this test and get the repulsion vector and actually make that be the movement direction. So we're just looking in the direction of the repulsion for some place to put us roughly. Um, so, so I honestly feel like we kind of have to do this, right? So, so when we do voxel start P, um, we kind of want this. If it's occupied, then 2p uh, is just going to be equal to um, from p. Right? Um, and this part here uh, is the only change that we make is we only do this code uh, the found best code uh, we only do that if we were unembedded and so now rather than have those in there uh, we should be able to do like an occupy code thing here which is like occupy untested occupy uh, 
like filled and occupy open or something. Something like that. Um, and so here, you know, we set these equal to these uh, so that now the code, we can just make the code more readable. Like instead of two, you know, it's occupy open. Um, instead of uh, zero, it's occupy untested. And then up here, uh, we just, you know, put those in there. Um, right? Uh, and just a little bit clearer what's happening there. Um, <sighs> C is just... C++ is the worst. Just freaking deal with it, dude. Enum typing is like complete garbage in C. Um, so I think that would work uh, for embedding as well. Um, and I think we're basically out of time, so I'll, I'll call it there. But next week, we'll just go ahead and and uh, tighten up this, this code. Uh, but I think this is probably much better than it was, right? Um, I think this is in much better shape. Way simpler. Um, much easier to understand and i think it will be like better too because it means that for like the same amount of testing you could use a um a more refined grid because you're not doing like all of this thinking about corners which is going to make it be less efficient right um so yeah so i think this will be good uh the only thing we now have to do is actually go do the part i was talking about before uh, where we only test uh, at aligned corners, which we're, we're just not doing at the moment, right? So the bug that we're talking about originally will should still be in there. Uh, it's not showing up at the immediate moment, but uh, the reason for that is because um, we disabled the code for checking it. We now allow things to get unembedded. So the bug is there, uh, but we're just not um, seeing it, right? Um, so yeah, we got a bunch of stuff to do, um, and we will do it, but, uh, that's the issue. So I'm going to put it to do in here. So when we do this collides at P, um, and, and maybe we don't even, maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe we just do like, um, an align to movement voxel. Uh, so we always do this. So that way we know like we're always going to test the position as if it was at the center of its movement voxel. So that way we don't ever have like that particular bug. Um, and, you know, again, so it shouldn't really change anything. The only thing that you will see is now you'll notice, you notice how like where things are is slightly offset from where they are tested. So like you can see how the white um, collision diagrams don't exactly line up with the blue collision volumes that is that snapping and again that snapping is to ensure that our numerical accuracy is doesn't matter um and our like we don't have to be careful about those things we're always going to test apples to apples even in the most extreme scenario because we're just forcing everyone to just be where their voxel is Um, so more work to do, definitely, but getting there rapidly. Um, I'm starting to really like this collision detector. I think it's going to be pretty good at the end of the day. Um, it just takes a while to get there because it's a complicated problem and you want, you have to kind of think it through and see opportunities as they arise and so on. Um, so yeah, obviously, uh, again, you, you definitely, uh, 
need the space partition though to make it be not too slow. Um, so that's something we're going to have to do. Um, but other than that, um, relatively optimistic about it. I would like to be able to turn off the diagramming. Um, but I don't have a button for that right now. We should have had one. So like in the editor code, uh, I actually don't remember what this is supposed to do, but like this, um, so like this, I feel like we need some kind of a global for So, you know, something like this. Where you just disable diagrams by pushing some button. And it just does... Something like that. <clears throat> I think that's probably the easiest way to do it. I'm not sure. Apparently not. Because while that, that doesn't seem to actually do the reset. Maybe I'm misinterpreting what that actually does. Oh, that's got the, yeah, that's got this garbage in there. Um, we really should have a way of controlling that part of things. <clears throat> I'm assuming that roughly what should happen there is the maybe there should be like a a thing here where it's like Like a capture frame count, something like that. You know what I mean? Uh, so, like, you set that capture frame count. Maybe that's the right thing to do, because then you can uh, just set that up to how many frames you want to capture, and that's what you have, right? Um, and I guess the you know, one annoying thing is we would like to be able to set the capture frame count to something um, originally, but This should be good enough. Mm. 
I don't actually remember what that is, but I think it's the step. Um, so anyway, um, so in theory now, like we could do a thing where we like capture more frames like so. Um, it's a little weird though, that it doesn't, I guess, cause reset, it's always going to capture like one frame. because that reset gets called at the end, right? So disabled diagrams is not really gonna do anything, but yeah, we'll take a look at that next time. We'll have to provide better controls for the diagramming than what we have at the moment. You can see like how slow it gets down here, right? So you can see like that the collision detector just takes all the time, right? Um, Cause this was previously running nicely and smoothly. So the spatial partition is a must have, and maybe we'll put that in soon. Um, but I do just wanna get this cleaned up a little bit more first. I wonder what I should do about the fact that you can go, like, the glove goes underneath these guys, right? Because, hey, the collision detector figures out that you can put it underneath, so when it tries to go under, it just rolls off. Anyway. All right, so we'll clean that up next week, um, but otherwise I think we're good. Any questions about that? Chat was too quiet. Be careful what you wish for, Technic Beam. There was 330 viewers, it looks like, so it was a fairly normal number of people watching. I guess they just didn't have much to say. Or Twitch chat is broken and they're all like frantically typing, but it's like just going into dev null or something. So you never see it. Yeah, so uh, just to be clear about uh, Mind Mark 42, the problem that we have with things moving um, that I was trying to explain earlier was just that we are using the corners of voxels to determine, we were using the corners of voxels and looking at them. And we then said, if you could be placed inside this voxel because like one of the corners was open, that meant that you could sit be somewhere in the voxel at least, then we allow you to be in that voxel. The way we test the corners is we were testing if you could put the entity at those corners against entities in their actual final resting positions, which are placed by the refinement algorithm, which means that the refinement algorithm and the corner testing are completely different. So depending on whether you're the person moving or the person being moved against, you're using completely different test. So it's trivial to get two objects if they're both moving, 
to be placed in a way such that from either of their perspectives, they are both colliding, right? Or rather, from one of their perspectives, they are now embedded because when the second person moved, they placed the object in a place that would invalidate all of the corners of the person against whom they're moving. Because the place where the person was actually placed doesn't happen to be one of those corners. So what I wanted to do instead is switch to a system where we always test voxel centers. And everything is always considered to be at its voxel center. So the test is always the same. And then when we do our refinement movement, we do do allow you to place things continuously so it doesn't like snap as it moves around. But when we place it there, it's only visual. So we, we put it there visually, but where we actually do the collision tech is still where the voxel is. That's why I align it back. So that way, everybody who ever does a collision test always tests each other based on the center of the voxel. And we know that it's the same. I don't think I do have chat set to subscriber only because there's tons of non-subscribers posting. So I think it's just. How much verticality is there going to be? Because gameplay wise, you may end up restricting collision to a plane. Uh, no, we don't have to restrict collision to a plane. You can just be totally free with that. I don't know if we'll use it, but the engine allows you to use it. So we, we don't have that restriction in the gameplay. You're allowed to um, to have collision work vertically. Uh, won't, won't that result in clipping? Uh, clipping. What is clipping in this case? Clipping is like a very nebulous term. It, it really got corrupted because what happened was because Quake uses a BSP, Carmack used to use the term clip into the BSP to for collision because you would push a point through the BSP and you would clip it in the way that you normally think of clipping. You clip the movement. So when you turn, when you wanted to move everywhere, you turned it on no clip. But, but that's like not the right term, right? So, but... Ah, okay, so uh, no, I don't think it does because we check based on the center um, only to the extent that we uh, want to collide against something. But when something's moving, we adjust its position. Uh, we do the collision checks on the position as well. So when we, we start at the center and we say, allow the thing to move inside the voxel that it's in, up to the point where it would collide with something and no further. Right? So you can't get inside a wall because as it tries to place the thing, it won't allow it to get any closer to the wall than if it was colliding. So everyone's still checking for collision. It's just that when you actually do your versus your collision checks versus each other, we do adjust you to the center of the voxel because we want it to always be the same. The voxel has to be small enough that the displacement of the wall won't be so much that you could dramatically, you know, like if the voxels were very large, then you could see that allowing you to put yourself significantly inside a wall because it's like, well, we're going to pretend the wall is very far away from where it actually is. Um, but because the voxel is very small relative to the size of the sprites, that really isn't a concern, right? Um, yeah, I knew you could do something about enum types, but I didn't know what spec that was in, so I never use it. Um, I am usually loath to add anything that's a new C++ feature, because usually what happens is if you use it, it sucks um, in ways that you don't know about yet. So you try to start using it, thinking it will be reasonable, and then it turns out like all your code breaks, because it actually isn't reasonable. 
Um, so I haven't tried that yet. I'm usually very skeptical about those sorts of things. But if that's now widely supported, um, I might consider it. Like, uh, I think what you're saying is that it would allow me to do... That. Right? Um, so, like... Uh, maybe? Um, I, again, I'm, I'm usually very, very, like, skeptical... Uh, so I tend, unless I really need a feature in C++, I usually won't add it, um, because almost every time I've ever tried to do that, it ends up being a bad idea. So, you know, do I really need that piece of code? No. So I probably would just leave it out. Um, but you know. It may be one of the rare C++ features that isn't totally awful, um, but I, I don't usually like to bet on that. So since I normally don't care, like normally you don't have this problem because normally you're not putting things in a U8, so you're usually okay. Um, but it is one of the things that sucks about the original way C was defined. So, you know, it's not like C did that right and C++ did it totally wrong or something, but... I, I a headless course I have never uh, corpse I've never read that book. What is the reason that things like sim region get passed around instead of plucking it from a global variable? Um, the reason is because uh, you might have more than one of them. Like we we even did that because we have a thing that we don't like leave it on right now, but we have a thing that allows you to do multi-threaded region updates, where like you can update multiple regions of the world at the same time. Like you could imagine if you had like a multiplayer situation where like one player was in one place and another player was in another place, they're completely separate, and you wanted to update both of them. Um, so the reason I generally don't put things in global variables is for that reason. Most things have at least a slight risk of needing to have two or three, you know, if not a hundred, right? And so it's pretty rare that I don't want to pass in just at least one pointer that's like, here's the context that you're operating in. And yeah, it's sort of a global but it's just not global enough that I don't want to have to go fix all the code um, because I usually know I'm like, yep, yeah, once in a while I'm going to want to have two of these live or something, right? So it's like a global, and I treat it like a global, but I just want it passed in because I know that sometimes I need more than one in flight. Not a thousand, but, you know, a couple. So... All right. Looks like we're we're good here. All 
All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining me for the episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you, as always. If you would like to follow the series at home, you can always pre-order the game on handmadehero.org. It comes with the source code um, so that you can follow along at home. And if you'd like to go inspect the uh, collision stuff, like I just kind of put that stuff in there just now, and, and next week will really be the time we're going over it. So if you would like to go ahead and uh, try yourself to kind of like iron out the the rough parts of the code before I do, um, you can give it a shot, right? Our Kickstarter is also currently going on right now. You can actually uh, just type Meow Book 2 Kickstarter into your favorite search engines, wherever they may be. Um, our Kickstarter is only one week left. So if you would like um, to receive your very own copy of a very cool graphic novel series, you can actually go there and do that right now. Um, the campaign went very well, so I guess there was a lot of people who were, um, yeah, it went very well. It went way better than we were expecting, um, to say the least. It's almost 300% of the, of the goal, so that's pretty cool. But there's not much time left for that, so if you're interested in that, please check it out. We'd love to send you some books from a print run, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's got all the information on here, so you can check it out. Um, anyway... That's about it for this week. Because it is still the last week of Kickstarter, I will be doing um, some more stuff um, this week that are Kickstarter related. Because like, i just been doing a lot of streams for publicity, uh, right, for doing PR to let people know the Kickstarter is available and to check it out and all that. And uh, there will be some more of that. So there will be at least two more streams on... Tuesday morning, uh, there will be a stream um, that will be another lecture, kind of like the University of Twente lecture. Um, for uh, a company asked me on the East Coast if I would do um, a presentation to, to their uh, company. Um, not exactly sure why, but that's just something that happens. Companies ask you to give talks sometimes. I don't know. Normally I say no, but in this case, it's during the Kickstarter. So, you know, during the Kickstarter, I'm doing PR stuff. I'm happy to do talks because part of my job description during the Kickstarter is, you know, to to, to do PR, right? So uh, that's going to happen Tuesday morning. The topic is still not necessarily determined. I have a list of topics they were interested in because I asked them. Uh, and I don't have to pick one from there, but I probably will. Cause I, I find it's usually better if I just like find out what the people who are at that company are like interested in of the stuff that I do. So, uh, I don't quite know yet, but it'll probably either be about cryptocurrency stuff or it will be about, uh, like the 30 million line problem kind of stuff. Um, so we'll see, but that'll be Tuesday morning. And yeah, it'll it'll be uh, it it'll be the well DJ Turfle. The the goal is to allow you to pay a lot more money for those. <laughs> um, that's what Starco Galaxy is. It's just we're still in development, right? So you can't have it yet uh, for that reason. It's uh. Uh, it's coming, right? Uh, I everyone's been asking for it for like seven years now, or something, six years, however long I've been doing this for. Uh, and I'm finally doing it. It's just very, very, um, it's very time intensive for me because I wanted to do a good job. Like, like when it goes from being me just sitting up in front of a blackboard randomly saying stuff, to this is actually a course that you're gonna pay for, right? I want it to be a certain quality level and I want to explore certain possibilities that, you know, require time. So it's just, it's like anything I do. It's a long development process because I don't just crap out the first thing I think of. So like, you know, that's the thing, but, uh, we're working on it.
Handmade Hero does work on Linux if you use community ports of it. There are people who have ported it to Linux, but I don't maintain a Linux port. So that kind of depends on you, right? Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, I was supposed to be signing off, and here I am talking about more stuff. No, point being, so, yeah, please check out the Kickstarter if you haven't already. Uh, Star Code Galaxy, which just came up, is just StarCodeGalaxy.com, right? Um, and you can sign up for the mailing list, but that's going to be the place where you will uh, actually find the full set of, like, everything um, that... Uh, Basically, like, a here's my idea of how you learn to program, right? Like, actually learn to program, not, like, the fake learn to program that people do when they get a CS degree, and not the fake learn to program that people do when they, like, go watch some crappy CPP con thing or take some seminar by someone who doesn't really program, right? Um, so, Star Code Galaxy is, like, this is how I think you actually learn to program. Like, if you actually want to know how to program, this is how I this is how you do it. Um, and like I said, it's a very big undertaking. It's been extremely difficult. Uh, I basically had to move on to it full time because there's so much stuff to do. Uh, but I'm hoping that you know, at least at that point, it'll just be like, okay, look, here it is, and we're done. So like, anyone who wants it, it's there now. I don't have to keep saying I don't know uh, where you would go to learn it. Because obviously people ask me all the time and that's what I have to say. I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't know how you learn to program currently because I there are no resources out there that are very good, right? So this will just be like, look, this is now, you asked me, this is my answer. I can definitively say that I think this is how you should learn to program. You know, that doesn't mean I'm right, but at least now I have an answer, right? And, and I can just be like, this is the answer for me is this. Um, but yeah, like I said, it involved creating a lot of new technology, uh, tons of stuff that no one's done before, or at least I've never seen anyone do before. And when you push into that space, you end up having a lot of work to do and a lot of experimentation. So even though the final thing that comes out maybe is something you could have built in six months, you had to spend two years experimenting to get there. Right. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's just a slow development process, and at the at this point now, I'm in in the phase of building the back end stuff because uh, that turned out to be a big issue as well. Just how do you deploy it? How do you update it? How do you have other people be able to use the tools to do things? All these sorts of things are like actual issues, and uh, I was not big surprise happy with any of the web stuff I found that I really didn't feel like it would be any good. Um, I mean that's kind of obvious. You just use the web, you can tell it sucks. So we're working on it. Um, it'll be done when it's done. If you sign up for the mailing list, we'll do our best to notify you, but our mailing list goes to spam all the time because Google sucks and can't program, and so does Hotmail or Microsoft. Big surprise there. Um, if you know it, The people who, who work on Gmail could maybe take the class and learn to program, but the problem is they'll never receive the email that lets them know that the class is ready because they program so poorly that it just goes to their spam folder right so it's kind of a it's kind of a weird like unfortunate situation where like um the people who should probably take the class and learn to code are so bad at programming that they wrote programs that don't let them get the emails that let them know that now they could learn to program you know what can you do uh but we're working on that we switched our email backend provider uh, and we're going to try and send the emails more regularly, so once every two weeks or so, so that we build up a reputation, which you now need. This is my favorite part. So, like, in their infinitesimal wisdom, um, you know, they, they crawled out of their crib to program Gmail, spam filter, and in their infinitesimal wisdom, what happens is the more you spam your users, the more legitimate they think you are. So if you send email every week, you're much less likely to be sent to spam than if you send email once every three months. So the worst act, the more you misbehave, 
the more they think you are a good actor, right? Like, you can't make this stuff up, but that's really something that they do because they are just that bad at their job, right? Um, so who knows? Maybe you'll get the email. Maybe you won't. Um, the people who definitely need to get the email definitely won't. Uh, so that's unfortunate. But, you know, you can only lead a horse to water if the water doesn't get sent to the spam folder, right? So... All right, so uh, that's about it. I will uh, catch you guys on Tuesday. Uh, if not on Tuesday, I have another cryptocurrency interview uh, with Alex Gladstein, or Gladstein. I don't know how he pronounces his last name yet because I haven't talked to him yet, but on Friday we'll find out. Um, so uh, I've got another cryptocurrency email, uh, cri cryptocurrency interview going uh, uh, on Friday, and that one should be interesting. Uh, it's a, a person who basically is interested in cryptocurrency uses because uh, they do like humanitarian work and they have a lot of like practical problems getting currency to foreign places where the banking system may not work very well and other things like this. And so, you know, uh, it's not so much going to be an interview about whether cryptocurrency works or not, but more about like what would, a, like, is there any possibility that there's a technology that we could build that would help in this situation or is it just never going to work, right? Um, and so, you know, off it would go, right? Um, off it would go. So we're going to do that interview and hopefully that'll be good, uh, but we'll see. So that's about it. I'll see you for those this week and I will be back here next week for Handmade Hero, same time, same place, obviously as well. So I'll see you in one of those. Until then, have fun programming everyone and I'll see you on the internet. Take it easy, everybody. Um...